Welcome back. Hope everyone had a good lunch break. Um, ready to kick off the afternoon session in the strategy stream. Uh, so starting us off uh, today, we have to kick off the afternoon session in the strategy stream. Uh, so starting us off uh, today, we have to kick off the afternoon session in the strategy stream. Uh, so starting us off uh, today, we have to kick off the afternoon session in the strategy stream. Uh, so starting us off. Let's try this again. Omar, over to you. Um, if you can uh, walk us through your, your cyber AI Let's strategy pack. Again. Omar, over to you. Um, if you can. OK. Thank you, uh, Ian. I'm assuming you can hear me. Um, there was a bit of an echo there, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kick ahead. Um, my name is Omaru Maruatona. I am the CEO of Iculus. Iculus is a technology company that specializes in, in API security. It's a, it's a great pleasure to, to be speaking at API Days. This is the, the fourth year that I've spoken at this conference. So uh, I, love, I, I love being here. I love uh, participating and, and contributing. I'm going to talk today about um, cyber AI in APIs. I mean, cybersecurity on its own is, is, is very topical. Uh, it, it's, it's front of center for a lot of businesses. Artificial intelligence is um, an area that has, over the last few years, become more and more prevalent in technology in, in how business is done. Um, and for me, looking at the advantages of those two areas, cybersecurity and AI, um, applying them in, in, in APIs, uh, I think there's great leverage in that, uh, there's great advantages in that. So my talk today will be exploring the value, the advantage, the potential um, um, a differentiator in applying or using cyber AI in, in, in APIs. Um, this is informed, obviously, from the experience we're having as Iculus. Um, we've been in the market now for four years. Um, it's also, um, again, you know, for, for lack of a better term, um, something that is, you know, uh, cutting edge. And, and I'm not using this to try and say we, we're better, but I'm saying it's a topic that is quite niche. When we talk to businesses about what we're doing, it's not everyone that understands you know cybersecurity and AI. Therefore, you know, I'm just talking here based on the experiences we've had, but also a bit of uh, looking into the future in terms of what I think um, is going to happen. You know, the first thing that I just wanted to put out there is, you know, as of 2019, you know, it was reported that 83% of web traffic was APIs. You know, this was back in 2019, and at the time, uh, the API adoption was increased, was predicted to increase fourfold uh, uh, up to 2020. So definitely it's a number that's grown up. Uh, the adoption of APIs is something that we've seen, you know, get bigger and bigger uh, uh, over the years. So that's, you know, the first you know, fact I wanted to put out there to say APIs are it doesn't look like they're going anywhere for now. They're increasing, the adoption is increasing. Uh, the transformation of legacy systems to have that API connectivity, we've seen that happen over and over again. Um, and leading to that is not surprising to, to, to get, you know, um, 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 uh, initiatives like what the National uh, Australia Bank announced in late 2020, where they were looking to build over a thousand uh, APIs, uh, some of them internal, uh, some of them external, right? Um, again, this reinforces the value of APIs and what businesses are seeing in uh, transforming their platforms into, you know, uh, uh, API um, uh, based um, um, technologies. Unfortunately, we will also continue to see uh, headlines like this, where 
with that rapid um, adoption of APIs, with that aggressive um, transformation to make platforms interconnected, um, there will be breaches, there will be security incidents, right? Um, and, you know, we're seeing very big companies uh, get breached. And, and it's not necessarily because, you know, there were, you know, lacks in terms of security. It's just the speed of, of the transformation where you're taking a whole lot of systems, uh, making them uh, connected from the outside through APIs. It, to me, so far from what we've seen uh, at Iculus, it's, it's more to do with the speed of that transformation. It's more also to do with the volume of services that are being exposed you know, inadvertently in that you know, very massive uh, transformation project. There will be things that you know, kind of go, 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 go uncovered. So cybersecurity immediately becomes very relevant in, the, in that rapid um, uh, API expansion or transformation. So, and again, consequently, this is why we're seeing as at 2021, over 11 API specific uh, companies come up. A lot of these are startups, apart from, uh, from Ping, who uh, um, acquired uh, another startup in the in the in the API um, uh, sector? I put that out there just to show that you know as API adoption as the API world gets bigger, we're starting to see a lot of startups pop up that specialize in API security. When I started um, Iculus in, in in 2017, you know I could have counted the number of API um, security. Um, uh, products or companies out there, when we had to do our very first investment deck, we had three competitors, only three that, that we knew about. Uh, as of now, you know, as you can see, there's over 10 others um, that have popped and a lot of them were founded, you know, after 2018. So relatively new companies coming into the space. Uh, there have been also some acquisitions. There have also been... Um, <coughs> Excuse me. There have also been uh, very big uh, acquisitions in, in the space. One of them is, as I said um, uh, earlier, Ping acquired a company called Elastic Beam. And that's because, you know, the, 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 the area, you know, API security, it's, 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 it's growing, it's, it's, it's getting hot. But what's underneath that is because uh, is, is that there is a lot of, you know, the, the the underlying security considerations that are going to go uh, with um, with a, a API uh, platforms. So, why does cyber AI matter in in in, in API as well? I've you know put together that uh, graphic over there to show first and foremost some of the main drivers in in the in the in the growth of of, of APIs. Right, um, open banking is, is is a key part of of, of, of that um, ecosystem. We're also seeing um, the rise of API powered uh, digital platforms. Um, many developed countries now are pursuing, you know, smart cities, smart nation type initiatives, where you have, um, you know, you're trying to drive um, as a as a as a as a as a country or as a city, you're trying to drive efficiency by being able to monitor the usage of resources, um, either at an infrastructure level, roads, buildings, um, and also looking at how those resources are being consumed uh, by the citizens. And the idea of that is to be able to, to be, able to be efficient with um, uh, infrastructure, whether it's electricity, whether it's, um, um, uh, um, you know, the city services in terms of sanitation, right? One of the big um, uh, examples that people use when they talk about smart city is, you know, uh, um, garbage bins that don't need to be emptied until they're empty. Uh, so the traditional approach there, just to give an example, is, you know, with, with garbage bins, you'd get days where, you know, the, the city authorities, the city council or the local council schedules days to empty the bins. But what they're realizing is sometimes, you know, you only find that in a particular street, you know, maybe one or two bins out of 10 need emptying. The rest, 
don't need emptying. And therefore to cast fuel, to cast, to save everyone's time and, and, and resources. What they're finding is more useful is only empty the bins that need emptying. And the best way to do that is to allow for the bin to have sensors that say, hey, this is uh, near capacity in this empty. So that's just, that's just one uh, example. Also the ability for which we've seen around um, Melbourne um, where people can know when a particular service is happening, right? With, with the tram stops now, you can tell when a tram is coming. Uh, the next part there is to look at when the tram comes, how full is it? Is it worth waiting for that tram or waiting for the next tram that comes after that? What's happening there underlying that is those different, you know, metrics and, and, and monitoring systems are communicating via APIs, right? And another, the, the, the last one is the idea of um, what a lot of businesses are doing now uh, post COVID. Traditionally, uh, a typical business strategy was you would have um, something like 55% and sometimes to 65% being physical um, 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 channel where if you are, for example, a retail um, 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 shop, you know, some of the big retailers that we have here, they're mostly dependent on physical sales, right? But what's happened after COVID is, you know, COVID showed that with a lockdown, that physical channel immediately dies and all you have is the, is the, the digital channel. So what a lot of businesses are doing are having to really review that strategy to say, do we have physical being the majority of what we expect ourselves? Do we invest more in the physical um, 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 channel rather than do more on, on, on the digital side? So consequently, a lot of businesses are really working hard to make sure that not only do they have a solid um, a digital business channel, but also that can that channel handle you know, very high traffic and again, if you're doing that now, chances are you will use APIs to, to, to be able to allow for that. So, you know, all, you know, this uh, different, you know, I, I'd say subsectors are powered by API uh, infrastructure. So consequently, we're seeing the global API market grow at 29% uh, uh, year on year. Uh, but unfortunately, according to Verizon, um, the average cost uh, from an API bridge uh, is two million, and this was um, as in two thousand and twenty, right? Um, that number is probably high now. Uh, the question I get a lot of uh, a lot of times is, does that number apply to small businesses or medium businesses? That's the average cost for any business. If you're losing, if you've got an API bridge that you know, significantly affects the way you serve your customers, there will be some reputation that goes with it on top of the direct financial loss. So, you know, it, it's a big issue. That's why cybersecurity is really, you know, prevalent or paramount in, in terms of how APIs are being built. And the, the, the AI advantage in terms of all of that is with APIs, uh, you're going to get volume. You're going to get a lot of uh, traffic in terms of your users, but also in terms of the different user trends. The traditional approach with um, 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 technology where you're trying to prevent fraud and abuse and, and, and making sure that you know services are offered to, to the legitimate requesters, was to be able to have rules that say, you know, these are global rules that say, if this happens, then that's a fraud. If this happens, then it should be blocked, right? The, where rules begin to struggle is if you have very, you know, multiple uh, nuanced use cases where different users interact with the system in very different ways, right? AI has an advantage there in that you could use, you know, mathematical algorithms to be able to serve very specific use cases. This is something that rules, you know, do not cope with, particularly the rate of change of, 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 of you know, the user trends. If you have a rule today and tomorrow there's an exception, you know, you wouldn't expect your technology teams to constantly be putting in rules and exceptions as the user um, uh, uh, trends change. But with AI, you have um, a capability that can allow for 
you know, that can accommodate that, 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 that rate of change. The next one is classification accuracy. You know, with AI, you're able to look at your historic data and be able to say, okay, given what we're seeing now in terms of the trends that are happening now, we can be 98% sure that if this happens, it's not a case we would want to see. It's a case we would want to block or maybe get the user to re-authenticate. Or if we're seeing this, we're 98% uh, confident that this is a proper use case and we should allow that. And what this means from a business continuity perspective is, you know, you're not constantly finicking with the technology. You're not constantly disrupting uh, the user experience for your users. And then the final bit is uh, adaptability. What AI allows is, you know, for a technology that is able to adapt as your, 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 your user demographics change, right? If you have more users, or if your existing users start to interact with the service differently, AI is able to keep up with that much better than you would have if you had rules. Rules would require, you know, constant user intervention. Um, you'd have to spend money to get people who, um, you know, on an ongoing basis, um, making sure that the rules are sufficient to serve, you know, the, the different business cases that you're getting. With AI, it's fairly, autonomous to an extent. Um, and, and that is the advantage that, you know, AI provides in this whole um, um, equation. There are challenges, obviously. Um, uh, the first one is, is, is the market hype, right? What, is, what we're seeing is because AI seems to be what a lot of businesses want to adopt, uh, want to have internally, it gets hyped up in the market such that if you do have a, a legit AI offering, you know, there's, there's always this um, 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 cynicism from, from, from the potential customers to say, ah, you know, it's, 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 it's a buzzword, right? Uh, and therefore, that's a, the number one challenge to get over is if there is a real use case which can make a difference to, to, to the users, to businesses, and ultimately to the end user out there, how do you get over the hype that gets created? The second part is democratization. And democratization, what I mean by that is because AI naturally is, is mathematical, you know, there's, there's a lot of science behind AI in terms of the models, the algorithms. Trying to make it easy for everyone to, to understand means you're simplifying a lot of things just so your audience can get what is being spoken about. But in that simplification, you also you know, hiding a lot of uh, useful facts that would make a difference to whether the business thinks this is valuable, this is useful, or the strengths or weaknesses of it. So in the effort to democratize AI, you know, we, we're having to accept a lot of, you know, loose, uh, 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 um, you know, loose facts are around the technology, what it can and can't do. And you know, as much as we do need everyone to come along the journey to understand, you know, the power of AI, I do see a lot of, you know, very plain, you know, words being used to describe concepts that I think, you know, require a bit more for, 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 for the audience to understand. I think democratization is useful, but it's also quite, um, uh, 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 you know, dangerous in that we're hiding a lot of details in, in the in the in the effort to 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 make it easy to understand and then the other part is is validation of, of true ai and this is the, the the effect of not having i guess enough trained and, and and qualified ai specialists to say if i'm a vendor and i think i have a product that can help a business and this product uses ai you know obviously for that business to adopt this product they need somebody with enough understanding of AI to be able to say, okay, this I can see how it works. I can see how it can be useful to us. The challenge in some cases is that such a person does not exist in, in the business that, you know, as a service provider, you would be uh, looking to, um, to help service. And consequently, you get, you know, I guess people who, they have, a, 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 um, I guess, a fair understanding of AI, but not a very deep understanding of AI. And therefore, 
it's 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 a it's a challenge to to really get over the nuts and bolts of this is how it works and this is how it helps because you know you're trying to 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 meet them halfway um but also i guess internally they're trying to be useful to 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 their company but also not wanting to you know to concede too much um or also to agree to things that they don't understand and that creates a friction in terms of how the products is truly understood right and then the last one is is something that i've been seeing come up a lot which is the bias and, and ethics of, of of ai um again this makes it hard to for it to be widely accepted as a useful technology but the thing with technologies like ai is that they'll always have that dual use case where it can be used for good it can also be used for bad uh, and therefore you know the emergence of ai ethics the ability to validate and check and make sure that you know the technology does not discriminate a group of people does not denigrate or or, or you know make other people look you know feel left out uh, is very important but again where we stand now um as as ai service providers it's a challenge to try and get over you know you know uh, uh, that hurdle but that being said i think i think you know there is a future for 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 ai particularly when it's combined with cyber security to help with the with the growing um um, um area of of of, of the apis um that's that's essentially what i had i guess the underlying message here is you know there is a need to to invest in in, in cyber ai uh that is cyber security with the ai capability uh particularly in 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 apis purely from the the speed at which api adoption is is going uh but also now given you know platforms and 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 the way apis are being used where there's a lot of traffic uh and user trends are constantly changing i think having cyber security that has that ai capability is is a powerful um idea and so i want to share that i hope that that was useful thank you very much thank you amal i think there's enough time for 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 questions uh ian yeah um with the democratization how far do you think we are down the road in terms of the maturity of of the answers as to how we mitigate um the, the ability to democratize because i think that that's one of the challenges you mentioned um and is there really work that still needs to be done in the ai space to improve how easy it is to democratize and make it easily understood um the ai rules that have been placed and how it's actually working um and how it's uh, how you're able to configure and, and change how the ai is behaving yeah you go I'll, i'll talk about that on two fronts uh the technology front and also just the general understanding uh part in terms of the audience the general population out there from a technology part right when i first got into ai you know there was not a platform that you could use for ai you know where we are now is you could use this there's a lot of note <clears throat> note so called notebooks which have software packages for different machine learning and ai packages so you you easily use a, a pre a predefined template to say you want a neural network here is a template for a neural network and you just add the parameters that you need Mm-hmm. it makes it easy to adopt the technology that's 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 really cool the danger though is you don't know the algorithms that are powering um what you're using that becomes a danger is you really don't know how far that algorithm can go either way in terms of doing good or or, or doing bad right that's the number one part the number two part again i i get the importance of making ai and, and 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 machine learning algorithms easily understood by the general population the danger is where you know in the in the in the need to be understood we're hiding you know not deliberately but we're missing a lot of the the detail that would make a difference to to how that particular technology is being used um, or also being perceived i think those are the two dangers how far we are in 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 getting over that i see a lot of 
people, particularly in my network, really, you know, attempting to understand, you know, taking courses, um, you know, taking articles that talk about some aspect of AI. I think that's good. And I think the education sector worldwide um, is seeing a lot of adoption in terms of AI research, people undertaking AI, you know, related degrees and, and PhDs and stuff. I think that's a good thing. So I think we're getting somewhere, but I just hope that we don't get to a point where everybody knows AI, but they don't really know AI. Yeah. And um, I guess as well with um, the legal requirements around bias um, and discrimination is how do you how do you ensure that your AI capabilities aren't falling foul of any legal obligations in that area as well um, if if its behavior can change over time yeah look the, the good thing in in that part is there has been um, some AI standards that I know Australia has their own AI standards in Singapore where we also operate they have AI standards Europe has its own AI standards the immediate challenge becomes if you want to provide your product in Australia, Singapore, and Europe, does it mean you're going to have to <clears throat> have to comply to all these standards? My hope is they're largely similar, right? They're largely, you know, uh, identical. That's number one. But number two, as well as with those standards, you would also have to have a way to quickly assess a particular product against those standards in a very you know, I guess automated way in a, in a very time effective way. If you have a set of standards and you're having to, you know, demonstrate compliance with each standard and it's manual and it takes long, then chances are it's going to be a long time before businesses see those standards as being useful. Right. I think that probably covers us for time. Thank you very much, Omaru. Um, that was a really, really good presentation. If anybody has any further questions, feel free to reach out directly uh, after this session. Um, but thank you once again for your time. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Pleasure.